Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Before we begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Executive Committee and the community for inviting me for the month of Ramadan. I think this is our fourth time coming for a series, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to return and see so many uh, friendly faces and old friends from several years back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a successful Shah Ramadan for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to be able to reach not only Laylatul Qadr but also Eid. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be able to achieve far more than we intend to in this blessed month, insha'Allah. For this series, I have a couple of requests. Everyone here has a mobile phone with them? Yes, everyone? Take out your phone. I don't want you to go onto Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. Ignore the WhatsApp messages. I have a request, and that is, if you have a Quran app on your phone, open the Quran app. If you do not have the Quran app, open Google. Okay, everybody. Now, for tonight, I'm going to ask you to have two verses of the Quran open. Just two. All the verses that we discuss will be on the screen, but I want you to have the verses open on your phone so that you can read them, so that you know where they are. Now, from tomorrow, my request is that you all bring your own copy of your Quran with you, every one of you, and a pen so that you can annotate your Quran and make notes on the verses that we will discuss. This is not haram. This is not going against the hurma of the Qur'an. So long as you know you are making these notes for the sake of goodness, it is permissible and encouraged. In fact, you will know, anyone knows, I have one Qur'an. I've had this for more than 10 years. I take it everywhere with me. I read it. I have many, many notes in my Qur'an. So for tonight, just for tonight, for those of you who don't have an actual physical Qur'an with you, have your phones available. From tomorrow night, please bring an on with you and a pen with you every one of you so that we can do this discussion series together what are the verses of the quran that i want you to have open on your phones for tonight the series the whole series the central verse that i'd like you to have available at your hand very quickly will be chapter number 38 surah sad verse number 29 if everybody has that open, that's one verse that we're going to need throughout the series because we're going to refer back to that time and time again. Well, that's the foundational verse for the whole series. But the verse that I'm going to talk to you about tonight in some detail and I want you to interact with me and talk back with me is going to be chapter number 24, Surah An-Nur, verse number 61. So everyone, please, please have chapter 24, verse 61, open and available from the beginning of the lecture and throughout the lecture, inshallah, so that you and I can actually discuss this verse. So the central verse is chapter number 38, Surah Thad, verse number 29. And the verse that I want you to have is chapter number 24, Verse number 61. I don't know how well you can read that because it might be very small for you. It's quite a long verse. Have it available in your Qur'an, inshallah. Everybody has the verse on their phone? Yes? Excellent. For the love of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, let us have a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salam. For the love of Lady Khadija, Imam Al-Hassan, and Imam Amir Al-Mu'mineen, whose makhsus events we are going to be remembering in this month, for them, allow sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sallam. And for the awaited saviour of humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-shari, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد Awaited Savior of Humanity, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, my respected teachers, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kindly open chapter number 24, verse number 61, Surah An-Nur, and read this verse with me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Laysa ala al-a'ma harajun. ولا على الأعرج حرج ولا على المريض حرج ولا على أنفسكم أن تأكلوا من بيوتكم أو بيوت آبائكم أو بيوت أمهاتكم أو بيوت إخوانكم أو بيوت أخواتكم أو بيوت أعمامكم أو بيوت عماتكم أو بيوت أخوالكم أو بيوت خالاتكم أو ما ملكت أو ما ملكتم مفاتحه أو صديقكم. Read it in English with me. There is no blame on the blind man, nor any blame on the lame, nor any blame on the sick, nor upon yourselves if you eat from your own houses. Or if you eat from your father's houses, or your mother's houses, or your brother's houses, or your sister's houses, or your paternal uncle's houses, or your paternal aunt's houses, or your maternal uncle's houses, or your maternal aunt's houses, or the houses that you possess the keys of, or your friend's houses. What a strange ayah of the Holy Quran. Think with me for a second. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, reveal such a verse to you and I in the Holy Quran, in revelation, capturing it for all eternity? Think about the verse very clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, there's no problem, no blame on you if you eat from your own houses or from the houses of your fathers or mothers, or from the houses of your family members, from the houses of your friends. What a strange thing to tell us in Revelation. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to reveal a verse telling me it is okay for me to eat from my own house? Does he not say that? There's no blame upon you if you eat from your own houses or from the houses of your fathers or your mothers. I mean, really Allah? Don't I already know that it's okay for me to eat from my own house or from the house of my father and mother or from my brother and sister? Do you really need to reveal a verse of the Quran to tell me this? Think about the number of things that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu could have told me Instead of this verse, Allah could have told me about the creation of the universe. He could have told me about the dinosaurs. He could have told me about the ending of the universe. He could have told me about the prophet and his character, the wilaya of Ahlul Bayt alayhi musalam. He could have told me about any issue in the universe. But he decided to tell me that it's okay for me to be able to eat from my own home. 
What's going on here? Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal this in the first place to those Arabs and the believers 1400 years ago that they needed to be told this? Or why would anyone reading this verse make sense of it for themselves? A hundred years later, a thousand years later, in the year 2023, wherever you are in the world, reading this verse, you might be in India, you might be in Australia, you might be in the United States of America. A person who is reading this verse today, what are they supposed to take away from this verse? How are they supposed to benefit practically from this verse? How do you benefit from this verse? Be honest with yourselves. How many times have you read the Quran year on year? You come for Quran Darsa. And someone definitely will be reading this verse. Maybe 10 people, 50 people, 1,000 people sitting. And every night someone will be reading this verse. Tell me, how many people have stopped to think about this verse and have it make sense to them? What is Allah actually trying to tell me in this verse where he tells me something so, I don't know, mundane, so simplistic, something so obvious, whatever word you want to be able to use, how many thousands of people tonight will read this verse but not make sense of it and just read the next verse and go on like nothing has happened. But yet the Lord of the universe, who is all-knowing and all-wise, chose to reveal this verse and capture it in revelation for all eternity no matter what age you are no matter what level of education you have no matter what level of wealth you have no matter what part of the world you are from Allah wants you to know this I go back why and you see those questions that we just raised are actually the foundations of tadabbur of Qur'an. Pondering and reflecting upon the Qur'an itself. When we ask, why would Allah Jalla Jalaluhu reveal such a thing? How did the immediate audience receive this verse, benefit from this verse, understand this verse? We're actually doing tadabbur of Qur'an. When I begin to ask the question, how does this verse affect me in my life, affect you in your life? We're actually traversing the horizons of the Quran. We're beginning to actually ponder and think about the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're moving away from simple recitation and parroting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devoid of any awareness of what he is telling me to actually go into the purpose of revelation itself which is to ponder upon the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hands up be honest how many of you have read this verse before ever read it? ever read it once in your life hands up a few hands a few hands I'm going to estimate and say about one third of you have raised your hands be honest how many of you have stopped and actually thought, what is going on here? Why would Allah tell me it's okay for me to eat from my friend's house? I mean, surely I already know it's okay for me to be able to eat from my uncle's house. How many of you go to your uncle's house or your parents' house or your own homes and then open the fridge and go, man, was I allowed to open the fridge? How many of you go home to your own houses at the end of the day and open the fridge? No, I'm not sure whether I should be doing this or not. And then, oh yes, Allah told me it's okay for me to eat from my own home. None of you. Why? It's Shaykh Badihi. It's something so obvious. But yet, yet, your Lord, my Lord, the one who is all wise, decided that this verse needed to be there for all eternity. I'm asking you a simple question. Why?
Now, I'm pretty sure, at least, in the most basic level, the cog is whirring. We're actually thinking, yeah, okay. I wonder what the catch is here. What's, what's the bombshell that Jaffa is going to tell us? There's no bombshell. At the end of tonight's discussion, we will come back to this verse, inshallah, and we will actually talk about what the meaning of this verse is. Now, I'm sure many of you already know the meaning. Some of you may not know the meaning. Maybe some of you are baffled. And this is the first time you're coming across these verses. Now, this brings me to the next part of my discussion. I said, how many of you have come across this verse before? About one third of you sneakily raised your hand. There was no one that, yeah, I know it. But about one third raised their hands a little bit shy, a little bit nervous. Is he going to pick on me if I say yes? But that means about two thirds of you were at least honest enough to say, I've not, I'm not come across this verse before. Now think about that very carefully. Some of you are 60 years old in this room. Fair? Some of you are 30 years old in this room. I'm not going to tell you my age. You can probably work it out from the number of greys that are here from the last time you saw me till now. Imagine how many times you've read the Quran. And yet there are some verses that we don't even know exist. How many times in Shah Ramadan have we read it from cover to cover, A to Z? Notice I didn't say A to Z, being a Brit. I need to acclimatize myself again. In case I get stopped at Homeland Security, at least I can speak their language, right? How many times have you read the Quran? And for many of us, the verse is strange. And I'm using my words, right? I'm not saying Allah is really making strange verses. But as strange and as random as this, we've not come across such things. It raises the pertinent question. Well, how much of the Qur'an are we missing? If we don't know an outstanding, strange verse like this, well, what else is in the Qur'an that I've never come across after 60 years of my life? Now here, the brothers kindly are going to put some more verses on the screen for us. And... If you look closely at the Qur'an, the Qur'an makes certain criticisms of us in the way in which we treat the Qur'an. You all know some of the famous verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allah says on the Day of Judgment, the Prophet will complain about his own community. Ya Rabbi, inna mahjura. My community left this Quran like a forsaken thing. We did hijrah away from the Quran. Right? You know this verse. It's a very famous verse that is often quoted. Do you know Allah goes even further in the Quran? So the brothers are going to put up chapter number 15, Surah Al-Hijr, verse 91. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alladheena ja'alu al-Qur'ana idheen. There are some who make the Qur'an into shreds. Idheen literally means to take and choose one part and reject the rest. Other translations say, it tear, we tear the Qur'an into pieces. The reason for it is because the meaning is I tear some parts out, I choose some parts, and I tear the rest out. Allah describes his own community. The Prophet describes his own community as treating the Qur'an like this, doing hijrah from it and tearing the Qur'an into shreds. SubhanAllah. And we do this. I asked how many of you have come across this verse before? But if I was to read you a verse of Surah Yasin, we would know it by heart. If we were to read a verse from maybe Surah Ar-Rahman, probably we know it by heart. We've heard it so many times. When someone dies, may Allah protect us. When someone dies, we read Yasin. We read, for example, Ar-Rahman. 
we read al waqia we read al mulk true but there's 110 other chapters of the quran that we barely barely know this is turning the quran into shreds taking some leaving the rest this is what we've done what we have done na'udhu billah is we've reduced the quran to a ceremonial book as a instead of actually taking it as the constitution of life and we should admit these things as to how our communities and maybe ourselves god forbid have taken the holy quran many of us leave it on the shelf or gather dust maybe when there is a wedding, we'll recite it, mashallah. When there is a death, we'll recite it, mashallah. On Thursday night, we'll recite all the same chapters, huh? Nothing different. You know, it's really interesting. We'll recite it on a Thursday night. Tell me, why do we recite the Quran on a Thursday night? Ahsant. May Allah bless you. I don't know if sure if you heard it. We recite the Quran on a Thursday night for our marhumin. Is there anyone who will deny this? Anyone? No. MashaAllah, we do. What do we do? We give them the thawab of our recitation. Thursday night is a spiritual night. They are given freedom to come visit us on Thursday nights, according to our belief system. So we recite it for the dead. In Surah Yasin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيُنذِرَ oh, uh, لِيُنذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا What does the word حَيْ mean? The ones who are alive. لِيُنذِرَ مَنْ كَانَ حَيًّا وَيَكَتْقَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ The Quran is actually for the living. We have reduced it to being recited for the dead. Think about that very, very, very carefully. Thursday nights, the most spiritual night of the week, we come to the Hussainiyah, we come to the mosque, and we're supposed to revive ourselves, right? So you imagine that the entire program should be based upon the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We recite the same surah every single week. And be honest, be honest with me, most people, they know it by heart by now, and so what they do is they just... Switch off. They're just listening to it in the background. So they're not learning anything else from the Quran. And they're actually reciting it for the dead. Whereas the very surah that they're reciting for the dead tells them it's for the living, not for the dead. Can you see how we've reduced the Quran to nothing more than ceremony? It's a shame and an embarrassment. No wonder we don't know verses that Allah is talking to us about. Someone gets married, may Allah bless them, the brother or the sister has to open the Quran and look at it very solemnly, because this is the day I'm leaving my mom's house, so I've got to look very solemn, and I've got to look at the Quran all holy-like. Someone's leaving the house, we have to walk underneath the Quran. All these things are good. No one's saying don't do them. They're rituals. But did the Quran, was the Quran revealed for that purpose? Did Allah reveal the Qur'an so you could walk under it? No. Was the Qur'an revealed so you open it and look at it solemnly whilst the nikah is being recited? No. But let's be honest. That's what the Qur'an has become for us. Or an istikhara. Mawlana, I don't know whether I should buy this house or not. What does the Qur'an say? Was the Qur'an revealed to tell you whether to buy that house? Was the Qur'an revealed to tell you whether to buy that business or not? Or to go on this holiday or not? This is what we reduced the Quran to. We made it Alladina Ja'al al Qurana Ilim. We torn it to shreds as per the words of Allah Himself, not me. Now part of the blame has to go on the ulama and the dhakirin. Because the way in which they've introduced the Quran has made it very scary for people. 
It's something that can't be touched by you. You can't think about the Qur'an for yourself. You must only go to Alim to tell you the meaning of the Qur'an. And so, over generations, people have become scared of this book. But Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, says in this Qur'an, I have revealed it for everyone. Hudanlin, Hudanlin, Nas. Are Nas just Shia? Are Nas just Muslims? Hudan lin nas, it's a guidance for all mankind, includes all mankind. It includes Hindus, it includes Jews, it includes atheists, it includes fire worshippers. And they are supposed to be able to pick up the Quran, read it and understand it and benefit. But when it comes to me and you, we're told, no, 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 only Maulana can explain to you the meaning of the verses. So now, Allah's words of its hudan lin nas has now been reduced to it's only hudan lin maulana. Alladheena ja'alul qur'ana adheen. This is what we've done to the Qur'an. Now because we become so separated from it, we don't read it other than the famous four chapters. And we're not allowed to really think about the Qur'an for ourselves because you're told only Mujtahid knows the Qur'an and not understanding it for yourself. All these different barriers have come in place. And over generations, this is what has happened to us. Part of the remedy is to admit that this is what we have done to ourselves. The series that we want to be able to introduce to you is practical techniques on how to be able to ponder and reflect upon the Holy Quran. Such that any one of us can pick up the Quran and have the tools to be able to understand it. That's not to say that after 15 lectures we're going to become Mujtahideen, no. But it means that you know how to navigate the verses. And when you look at a verse, you might know how to make sense of it and go deeper into it for yourself. There's still the reliance on statement of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam still the reliance on tafsir to explain the meaning of the Qur'an, but to remove the barriers between us and the Holy Qur'an and to give us the tools practically to be able to reflect and ponder upon the Qur'an for our own selves. That's what the series will look at, inshallah, over these 15 nights, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. What we want to start with for tonight, something very simple, is to be able to just look at those verses of the Qur'an which compel us to be able to ponder upon the Qur'an, that gives us that incentive to be able to do so. And then we want to go back to that first verse that we raised about you're permitted to eat from your own houses, from your houses of your mothers and your fathers. And I'm going to do a simple exercise with you. I'm going to tease out the meaning of the verse. And I will assure you now that within 60 seconds of teasing the meaning out, you will have understood the depth of the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you from that verse. I will show you how easy it is to ponder upon the Quran, to go into its depth and understand its message for yourself. Even such strange verses that at face value appear very difficult to make sense of. And that hopefully should give you the confidence in seeing how we're going to take this series on over the next two weeks, inshallah. So on the screens, there should be some verses of the Quran that are going to come. And uh, if you can note them down in your phones, all well and good. Uh, otherwise, inshallah, just read them with me and We'll pay attention to these verses together, inshallah. So the next verse that will come up is chapter number 47, verse number 24. A very famous verse of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us here to perform tadabbur. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not then ponder upon the Qur'an? Or are there locks upon their heart? Now this raises a question, isn't it? Is it 
that we don't reflect because there are locks upon our heart, or are there locks upon our heart, thus we do not reflect? Yeah? This is a topic for maybe later on, inshallah. But see how Allah is introducing the topic. Allah is asking us here, why do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? Now imagine God addressing you and me directly. He will do this on the Day of Judgment, won't he? Why did you do this? What motivated you to do this? What was your moment of sincerity in this? Allah is actually talking to us here. Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an? Do those people who are followers of the Qur'an, do they not actually think about it for themselves? Allah is asking us here. When Allah asks us a question, it is not a passive thing. If I ask you a question now, if I say to you anything, what car do you have outside? What's your favorite coffee in the morning? None of you will ignore the question. You will actually answer it. You'll actually think to yourself, okay, this is the answer. Allah Jalla Jalala, who is asking us here, do they not reflect? Or is it that their hearts have become locked, closed off from this tawfiq of engaging with my hearts? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking. The next verse, chapter number four, verse number 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An Nisa, he follows up with another verse where he says, Do they not reflect upon the Quran? Had this Quran been from any other, you would have found in it much contradiction. I'm sure the verse will come in a second, inshallah. Allah in this verse is saying, look, when you actually ponder, you will find the answers. Why? Because there's no contradiction in my words. When I tell you something, and I tell you something else in another chapter and in another verse, this Quran is perfectly aligned, and you will find the meanings coming out. Allah is assuring you here of the success of your pondering. Do they not ponder upon the Quran? This Quran from anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would have found in it so much contradiction. But you won't be able to because my words are perfect. So Allah here is encouraging us to ponder and he's assuring you of positive outcomes. here. Very important. Another verse I want to be able to show you is the verse which is the central verse for the entirety of the theme of our series. Chapter number 38, verse 29. You all have it in your Qur'ans, on your phone, on your apps. Look at this verse and I want you to really pay attention to this ayah of the Qur'an as it is the theme for the entirety of the series. If someone asked you a question, someone came to you, a Christian, you know, I'm sure you meet with Christian brothers and sisters, especially coming to this church, you must come across them on some programs, there must be some engagement. Imagine a Christian or an atheist, or someone came to you and said, Brother Muhammad, Brother Ali, Sister Fatima, what is the purpose of revelation? Why did God reveal the Qur'an to you? What would you say? In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the answer. He says, the reason for revelation is for you to ponder upon it. Now just think about that for a second. Most people will say, for me to recite it. Most people say the reason for revelation, for example, will be, that it gives me guidance. These are right answers, aren't they? But Allah gives you a specific reason in the Quran for the revelation itself, and that was for you to ponder upon it. Read the verse. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kitab anzalnahu ilayk. A book revealed to you. Now you will know at least a bit of Arabic language. Ilayk is different to ilaykum. If I said assalamu alaykum, and I said assalamu alayk, what is the difference? 
Kum means what? You all, Ahsant. Ilayk means what? To you personally. Assalamu alaykum. To you directly. Assalamu alaykum is all of you. Look at this. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk. Now, some people understand this that it was revealed to the Prophet. And then Allah says, Mubarakun. It was a blessed book. Why did Allah reveal it? So that they may ponder. Now, look, this is very interesting because the grammar here shifts. Is plural. The wow and the alif is plural. It's everyone. See, if the verse has said, then it would have been one person. Understand the verse. A blessed book revealed to you. Is it to you, the prophet, or to you, the individual mu'min? I can't decide. Allah then explains in the verse the next part. Why? So they may all ponder upon it. Not one person, not you, Ya Rasulullah, you only ponder upon it. You see, some people, as we'll talk about in tomorrow's discussion, some people say only Ahlul Bayt can ponder upon the Quran. You, as an ordinary mu'min, are not permitted. Allah says, No, I revealed it to you so that you may all ponder upon it. Ayatihi. The lam li yadabbaru. Lam. Lam al illa. It's lam of the purpose, the reason for something. Li yadabbaru ayati. So that you may all ponder upon it. Waritadakkara. Ulul al bab. And that people of reason might actually bring it to mind. Someone asks you, why was revelation revealed? So that you and I actually reflect upon the Quran. That's the purpose of revelation. Not for it to be kept on the shelf, not for you to recite Yasin once a week, not for you to recite Yasin when someone dies. Those are all good deeds, but it's not the reason for revelation. Now, when you have the purpose for something and we don't do it, we're missing the purpose. It's great. We can do all the other stuff. We can do all the flowery things we want. You can paint Quranic verses if you want. You can learn it by heart if you want. You can give the Quran to other people if you want. You can wax a miracle about it. But that's not the purpose of it. And we can go out of our way to avoid the purpose of it. And do everything but the purpose of it. But we should not kid ourselves and say that I'm actually doing what the Quran asked me to do in terms of its purpose. We wouldn't allow it with anybody else. We wouldn't allow it with any other religion. We wouldn't allow it with our own children. We tell them to do something, that this is the reason I'm asking you to do this. And they give us 50 excuses. Yeah, but I did this. I asked you to clean your room. Yeah, but I did the dishes. Yeah, but I went to school on time. Yeah, but I put my clothes in the wash. Those are all great things. I'm very proud of you. Well done for putting your clothes in the wash. But that's not what I asked you to do. Would you give them any grades, any marks at home? Would you say, well done? Would you say, hang on a minute. But this is what I asked you to do. It's great that we recite it. It's great that we are very particular about certain surahs. That's not what Allah revealed it for. The purpose of revelation is that we may ponder upon it. If the brothers can go back to the first verse of the discussion that we opened with, and all of you as well, if you can open in your phones, chapter number 24, verse number 61. And I want to conclude by thinking about this verse with you. And within a minute or two, I really believe 
that you will understand this verse so perfectly. And you'll see how easy it is that the moment you just think about it and ask very elementary questions of it, not only will it make sense to you, but the profundity of the verse will come to your eyes and heart. Everybody has the verse in front of them? Everybody? Let's read it once more in English, inshallah. There is no blame upon the blind man, nor blame upon the lame, nor upon the sick, nor on yourselves. That you eat from your own houses, from the houses of your fathers, or your mothers, or your brothers, or your sisters, or your paternal uncles, or your paternal aunts, or your maternal uncles and your maternal aunts, or the houses that you own, or if you eat from your own friends' houses. What does this verse mean? Why would Allah reveal it then? Why would Allah want me to read it 1400 years ago here today in 2023? Do I benefit from such a verse? Now I'm going to ask you questions and I'm asking you because I want you to reply and help me to understand the verse along with you as well, inshallah. First simple question. When you go to your own houses, is there any blame on you if you open your own fridge and pull out some food? No. Or if you go into the pantry and you pull out some food? No. Okay. If you go to your parents' houses and you open the pantry or the fridge and you pull out some food, is it a strange thing? Do you feel the need to get permission from your parents to be able to take food out of their fridge? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. Why not? It's a genuine question. Kadim comes home. And he comes, he's moved out recently, right? So he comes in, and you're sitting at the dinner table, and he opens the fridge, and he just pulls out, I don't know, he just pulls out an OJ. Why does he not need your permission? It's a genuine question. Why does he not need your permission? Say that loudly. You should consider it his home. No one would dispute that, right? Your own son walks into your house and opens the fridge and takes something out. It wouldn't even cross your mind to be like, what are you doing? There's no such thing as even raising an eyebrow because it's just not possible. Now let's raise this question slightly differently. I have the honor of staying at your house. May Allah bless you for putting up with me and my mess and whatever else will come from it. If I opened your fridge door, I need to be careful with this guy. I don't know how he's going to react now. If I open your fridge door and... I just pulled out something to drink, something to eat. Would that be okay? Okay, in what context, sure, because I'm your guest? Or if I wasn't your guest and I just happened to be invited to your house, genuinely, genuinely, if I just happened to be invited to your house and we were sitting talking, I just got up halfway through the conversation, like Kazim may do, but I just got up halfway through the conversation, I just moseyed on down to your fridge, just opened it and pulled out something. Genuinely, be honest, in your heart, would you be like, what, what, what's he doing? Like, I don't mind, he's welcome, but at least to ask, which one would it be? Be honest with me. <laughs> not just asking, genuine concern. Yeah, genuine concern that maybe my akhlaq is not very good, or what else is he going to take, or, but you understand. Now, here's the question. What is the difference between the first and the second? Kadhim comes and takes something out of the fridge. He answered, it would never be, it's his home. But it's not my home, is it, to be able to come and take food out? If I'm a guest and you said, it's home for you, please make yourself a home. Whatever you need is yours. Mikasa is sukasa. Baini, or Beiti, Beit Kum. My house is your house. We've established some parameters here, haven't we? And I can go freely to be able to open the fridge, as an example. Now, having kept all this in mind, I want you to reread the verse with me now. Think about this. There is no blame on you if you eat from your houses, 
or if you eat from your father's houses, or if you eat from your mother's houses, or your brother's houses, or your sister's houses, or your paternal aunts and uncles' houses, or your maternal uncles and aunts' houses, or the houses that you own, or your friends' houses. Tell me, what's going on here now? The first answer that was given was, the reason as to why Kazim would not would be fine to go and open the fridge is because he should feel at home. What do you think now Allah is saying to you here? Okay, let me reword the question. Let's say you walked into your maternal aunt's house or your paternal aunt's house and you're able to just open the fridge and eat from it. Should you feel any discomfort in going to the fridge, yes or no? Should your aunt feel any discomfort in you going to your fridge, going to her fridge? Should they? What is Allah saying though? Close, close, not open house. What is Allah saying here? Risk is from Allah for sure. But what is Allah saying about your relationship with these categories of peoples? Think about this answer. The answer was absolutely right. The reason as to why Kavim can go into his father's house and open the fridge and take something out and not even, it wouldn't even enter the mind to go, what are you doing? The reason why I can walk into my mother's house or my father's house and do that, and then not think, well, what am I doing? It is because it's home. Now relate that back to this list. Is the list in Allah's eyes limited to me and my father? Is it limited to me and my mother? No. Who is the list expanded to? Your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, and even your friends. Understand this. What is Allah saying to you in this verse? The answer is, Allah is saying that in a family unit, you should be so close and comfortable with one another that it is easy for you to be able to open the fridge in your own house as easy as it should be for you to open the fridge in your mother's and father's house and in your brother's and sister's house and in your uncle's house and even your friend's house. That's how tight-knit you should be as a family unit so close, so comfortable with one another that there is none of this feeling of separation or anxiety with one another such that you can even walk into the house of your uncle or the house of your auntie or the house of your children or your whatever family members and you should all feel so comfortable with each other that you can even just go into one another's fridge and be able to eat from one another's houses. That's the way a family unit should be. Allah goes further. He doesn't just say family, does he? What does he say? And you should be able to go into the homes of your friends and be able to do this. Think about this very carefully. We're not all that close, are we? Some of us. But some of you are very, very close. You go back 10 years. You go back 20 years. You go back from different countries. You've grown up with each other. You've looked after one another. You've been in the community with each other for 20 years. This community is at least that old, right? You're coming up to three, four generations now. How long have people known each other? Can any one of you be so comfortable with each other, so trusting of one another, that if you're in the other person's house, you're comfortable just to be able to go and eat from their houses? 
If not, after 20 years of being a community, well, where are we? You understand? Look at the bar Allah is raising for us as a family unit, the trust and companionship and expectations that are upon each other, not only as family, but even as friends. That you can come into my house and feel free to be able to eat from my house. That's the way we should be with each other as mu'mineen and mu'minat. Now you've understood the verse at one level, compare it with the way in which our family members are often are with one another. How rigid, stuck in the mud, we can sometimes be with one another, with community members, with friends. Compare the ayah with how I am, or with how some of us are. I can't even let someone into my fridge to be able to get an OJ out. How would I be when he's in a time of need? If I can't even give to him this, what happens when he goes bankrupt? What happens when he falls ill? Is he gonna, am I going to be there for him or not? Can you see? Now let's go a little bit further and then conclude. Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking literally about eating? from one another's houses only? Is this what he's limiting it to? Is he limiting it to you going into the pantry and getting a chocolate out? Is this what he means by the ayah? So what do you think he, now that you understand it, what do you think else is going on in this verse? If it's not limited to simply food, what does it include? Close proximity to everything. Based on good relations with each other. You know there's a hadith from our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayhi. He says at the end of time, at the time of Imam al-Mahdi, ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-sharih. At the time of our 12th Imam, a mu'min will be able to go into the hand, into the pocket of another mu'min and take money from them without the second person feeling in the slightest bit aggrieved. This is a hadith. Often we come across these hadith about what the 12th Imam's time will be like. We say, subhanallah, how will the, the people be so kind to one another, so generous to one another that I can go into your pocket Take a $20 bill and you don't even blink an eye at it. You think that's going to come overnight? You think the 12th Imam is going to wave a magic wand and then the Mu'mineen are going to be so kind with one another? Be honest. Did the Prophet come and just wave a magic wand and everyone became, you know, dancing hand in hand around, you know, the hills of Mecca, singing Kumbaya? Is that your image of what the Prophet did to people? Or did he help them to understand the goodness that existed within their hearts? Brought it out. And he made, it, made them live it until it became normal for them to treat one another like that. You know what the Quran describes the way the companions used to live with one another? The Quran says in Surah Al Hashr, chapter 59. They preferred the other over themselves, even though they were broke. No money. Poor. They still preferred to give to the other mu'min, even though they were poor. The Prophet brought that out of them. Can you see? When the 12th Imam alayhi salam comes, it's not going to be that we just switch on the lights all of a sudden and everybody acts like the Quran. We have to build to get there. And then he comes. Look at the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes a family unit. Look at the way Allah describes a community, a friend circle that looks after one another, that can be caring for one another. And it's so open, open house. Not only open house, open-hearted with one another. This is the bar that Allah sets for us. Now, 
All I wanted to do was show you an example of a verse that we may have read many times in our life or may not have come across. That is apparently very, very strange. But actually, when you just think about it, and you just rationalize it, and you talk about it, it all makes sense. And it crystallizes in front of us the expectation that Allah has upon them. Look at how Allah begins the verse. Now here's the challenge. Not only is there no problem for you eating in your own houses, there's no problem for the blind to come and eat at your houses. No problem for the disabled to come and eat at your houses. No problem for the sick to come and eat at your houses. You know why this Quran, this verse was revealed 1400 years ago? Because the Arabs in their jahiliyyah forbade those categories of people from entering into their houses to eat with them. The first part of the verse lifts the jahiliyyah from them. The second part dates them to the way the family unit was meant to be, and the third part, the way the community was supposed to be. In one verse, Allah takes them stage by stage by stage. He didn't reveal the, the end. He didn't say, now make sure friends can eat from friends' houses. He started with getting rid of the illnesses, the disease in their heart, that anyone who was sick, anyone who was blind, anyone who was disabled, first have mercy. Let them into your houses. Normalize that. Get rid of the darkness that lies within you. And then expand your mercy to your family members. Don't feel aggrieved if one of your family members comes home and wants to eat from your houses. Don't place a barrier between you and your family members. And then once they normalize that, Allah put the last part. Let your friends, your community into your houses. The Ansar and the Muhajireen. The new converts that were coming from farther afield. Sometimes they'd never even met them. Come home, brother. You're a new Muslim, mashaAllah. Where have you come from? Which tribe have you come from? Come sit with me. And you see, this is tadabbur of Quran. Take one part of the verse, the next, the next, and it opens your horizon. So this is what we will be studying in our series, inshaAllah. In the first part of our series, we're going to look at the permission, permission to do tadabbur. We're going to look at the different reflecting what is tadabbur, what is tafakkur, what is ta'ammul. In the second part of our series, we'll look at the prerequisites, and then we'll look at ten techniques practically pondering upon the Qur'an. And this will be our series. Please, everybody from tomorrow, bring your own Qur'ans, pens and pads, and inshallah, we will go through the series like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us proximity to the Qur'an, opportunity to ponder upon it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this endeavor easy for us. May Allah make our fasts successful and our a'mal in the month of Ramadan accepted. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant shifa'a to all those who are marid around the world. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. وصلي يا ربي على خيرتك من خلقك محمد وآله الطاهرين